Good afternoon. Um, so my background is, my academic background is in public diplomacy generally. My academic background is not in Russian active measures, so uh, I did study it, but there are limits to my knowledge and I'm sure there are some of you who are much more uh, ingrained in that than I am. But uh, in this presentation, I will be discussing whether Russia recognizes public diplomacy as a mechanism distinct from the nation's use of active measures, or if Russia sees public diplomacy as another mechanism in the toolbox of active measures, and what this means for Russian public diplomacy and whether or not it's actually effective. To this end, I will briefly discuss the concepts of public diplomacy, soft power, and active measures. Each of these mechanisms are defined as tools states use to achieve foreign policy objectives. They are tools which determine the nation's relations with the rest of the world and how that nation reaches its foreign policy objectives. To this end, I'll examine specifically Russian international behavior in just at the end of 2013 and through most of 2014, looking specifically at the Winter Olympics in Sochi and the invasion of Crimea. So evaluating Russian public diplomacy is a difficult business because the concept of public diplomacy is generally associated with the United States and the West, and by extension, Western ideas of diplomacy and diplomatic behavior. This is particularly important to keep in mind when considering Russian international broadcasting as either an aspect of public diplomacy or a tool of active measures, as we will see when we get further on in the presentation. In the context of the United States, some critics and scholars argue that public diplomacy is simply a euphemism for propaganda, which is again something to keep in mind when we think about how Vladimir Putin views Western international broadcasting as an arm of Western propaganda. Public diplomacy scholar James Pamet noted that attempts to theorize and understand the concept tend to be normative or idealistic, even by Western standards. This is the call that uh, it, for new public diplomacy to be two directional, um, both the country engaging in it and the country receiving the public diplomacy should have a two-way exchange, and the argument that Cold War public diplomacy was unidirectional. Generally, public diplomacy is recognized and defined as a diplomatic engagement with the people of another nation. This is in contrast to more traditional diplomacy which occurs between governments and governments. Beyond this very general definition, the concept is still in limbo among practitioners and scholars of public diplomacy. More recently, scholars are attempting to look at public, diplo public diplomacy as a concept outside of the West. For our purposes today, the, the definition given by Garth Jowett and Victoria O'Donnell is particularly interesting because they put it in terms of a mechanism as a tool of foreign policy and a tool where the intent is to shape public attitudes. They define public diplomacy as dealing with the influence of public attitudes on the formation and execution of foreign policies. It encompasses dimensions of international relations beyond traditional diplomacy, the cultivation by governments of public opinion in other countries, the interaction of private groups, and interests in, other country, in one country with another, the reporting of foreign affairs and its impact on policy, communication between those whose job it is to communicate, and as diplomats and foreign correspondents, the process of intercultural communications. To help us along with identifying Russian public diplomacy, I will be using Nicholas Call's five practices, core practices of public diplomacy, which he identifies as being listening, advocacy, international broadcasting, exchange diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, and psychological warfare. Call argues that these are standard practices used around the world regardless of cultural background. And most of these practices are self-explanatory, but some um, especially because we're going to go into active measures require maybe a little bit more definition. Particularly advocacy. This is where an actor promotes a specific policy or policies to the people of another nation. As we'll see, Russia does do this. It's just a question of how they do that. Psychological warfare. An actor 
communicates directly with the public of the enemy to achieve war objectives, which is maybe something that a military professional might disagree with. It's a very narrow definition of psychological warfare. Cultural diplomacy, I also put it on there as uh, being more defined um, because, again, how Soviets viewed culture throughout the Cold War. The, in the context of public diplomacy, it's where a nation ensures its cultural resources and achievements are highlighted overseas to transmit a nation's culture abroad. Uh, during the Soviet Union's era, they viewed culture and sports diplomacy as a type of impregnation propaganda. It was a way to seed things in um, under the radar, so to speak, to soften the audience. Another way to look at public diplomacy is through the concept of soft power. Soft power uses the attraction to gain support for a nation's policy without the use of force. People or nations may be inclined to support another nation's policies due to the attractiveness of their nation, the appeal of their culture. All nations have some element of soft power through their, cult, uh, through their culture, such as food, music, art, and literature, national values, and foreign policies. The problem with soft power is that unlike hard power, such as military force or economic sanctions, just because people find your culture or national values or foreign policies appealing or attractive does not necessarily mean that they will support you, uh, if, especially if those policies don't work to their interests. Furthermore, while all nations may retain the means of soft power, this does not mean that they actually wield it in a way that would increase attraction or a level of goodwill or influence. Sorry. More often, nations tend to undermine their soft power. It should also be remembered that bad policies or unpopular policies diminish a nation's soft power, regardless of the nation's parallel use of public diplomacy. And again, this is something important to keep in mind because, as we will see when we go through the events of 2013 and 2014 in Russia's international behavior is, yes, they're doing public diplomacy, and that's running in parallel to the other things they're doing. And does that actually diminish their soft power and diminish the effectiveness of their public diplomacy? So with these concepts in mind, let's look at Russian public diplomacy. So they do have international broadcasting. Um, the advent of RT and Russia Profile and some of the other international broadcasting came out of the color revolutions of the early 20, 2000s, the Orange Revolution and the Rose Re Revolutions in late 2004 and 2005. This prompted Russian interest in international broadcasting, feeding into Russian views of Western competition and intentions to undermine their national power or national security. Just uh, to tag along from what Hodakevich uh, presented preliminarily about uh, Russian views of NATO, uh, in 2013, NATO actually did a study of Russian public opinion. USA was ranked as the second threat to Russian security under terrorism. UK was fifth, Japan was eighth, the EU was ninth, and NATO was 11th, just under Russian internal, internal problems. Interestingly, another threat mentioned by survey respondents to Russian national security is information warfare. Um, added on to this, uh, Vladimir Putin was also concerned about Russian national image, which brings us to the other element of Russian public diplomacy. They do listen. So in 2003, Russia commissioned a public opinion survey to see how the West views Russia. The top things respondents associated with Russia were communism, KGB, snow, and mafia, in that order. The only brands associated with Russia were Molotov cocktails and Kalashnikov rifles. <laughs> Russian art and culture came in dead last. <laughs> Vladimir Putin was convinced foreign correspondents in Russia were responsible for the distortion of Russia's image. And again, this goes back to this idea that the West is impinging on Russian um, national power, they're shaping their image, they're, for, they're basically boxing them in, and that feeds that perception. <coughs> advocacy. So there's a couple of examples of Russian advocacy that we've seen more recently. The one that first springs to my mind when I was thinking about this presentation was um, in 2013, 
after, it was about a month after the uh, Syrian government used uh, chemical weapons. And Vladimir Putin thought this was a wonderful time to insert an op-ed in the New York Times on September 11th of all times. Uh, the article stressed, uh, and I'll get into this again later, that, that uh, the uh, Assad regime didn't actually use chemical weapons and that the international communities should stay out of Syria. The problem with the article, well there were two problems with the article. One, it was later discovered that a PR firm actually put it into the New York Times um, and that that PR firm does a lot of work for the Russian government in terms of their um, international or advocacy work. Uh, it was also, the article kind of was highlighted because it it came across a little tone deaf and rather than striking a friendly chord of discussion between Russia and the American public, it chastised the Americans for being uh, hung up on our exceptionalist ideas, that we are an exceptional nation and that we are there to bail out other countries. So rather than kind of highlighting the policy that Putin wanted to advocate for, which was no international involvement in Syria, everybody else was talking about all the other not nice things he was saying about America and our ideas of how great we were. So it kind of didn't really work maybe the way that he had hoped. Uh, another example of Russian advocacy happened uh, with a dispute between Russian state-owned Gazprom and Western-backed Ukraine over national gas prices in 2006. They couldn't reach an agreement over the gas prices and Russia ended up cutting uh, gas export exports to Ukraine. Again, the PR firm Ketchum stepped in, um, and the, uh, one of the VPs there, Paul Cohen, explained that the Kremlin believed Western powers had been pushing Gazprom to stop subsidizing gas for Soviet countries instead of selling it at market prices. Cohen went on to say that Ukraine and Western sympathizers insisted that Russia was using gas as a political weapon to punish Ukraine for turning toward the West. So again, this is that East-West, the you know, the West is coming to get Russia, and it's driving a lot of their um, public diplomacy or something. All right, on the cultural dis diplomacy side, the Russians sponsored a winter festival in London's Trafalgar Square. Uh, in 2014, the UK and Russia did a year of culture, which will be interesting when we get into the events of 2014. Um, and then uh, uh, Russian oligarch donated or uh, loaned out his collection of Matisse's to uh, Paris Museum to sponsor the Icons of Modern Art display in France. And the Russians are currently uh, building a uh, Russian cathedral display right next to the, uh, or the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, on the exchange diplomacy side, we have the Pushkin Prizes. Uh, which is an exchange between Russian and Scottish uh, uh, young writers that happens every year. Uh, in 2014, uh, Russia and Germany reached an agreement to do youth exchanges. And then we have the Russian Union of Youth, which also sponsors exchanges primarily between Russia and China. So they do do public diplomacy. All right, so let's look at active measures. Typically, the concept of active measures is associated with the Soviet Union. However, multiple sources claim that, that Russia today is using the same techniques identified as traditional tools of active, Soviet active measures. The concept of active measures is difficult to pin down as it's comprised of many activities listed there on the screen. I don't know if you can see it. It's establishing and funding front groups covert broadcasting, broadcasting, media manipulation, disinformation and forgeries, and agents of influence. Um, the USIA report on Soviet active measures from 1991 described it as the Soviet approach to international relations and a form of political warfare with ma manipulative and deceptive techniques. Active, major, active measures was a major component of Soviet foreign policy. Uh, it included public and overt activities as well as covert and semi-covert, or in terms of propaganda, white propaganda, gray propaganda, and black propaganda. Each of the methods of active measures was used for the purpose of influence working in concert towards a larger objective. With these concepts in mind, let's look at inter Russian international behavior in order to better understand whether 
Russia sees public diplomacy as a distinct from its use of active measures or whether it is in fact part of Russia's active measures toolbox. This will allow for some evaluation of whether or not Russia's public diplomacy is in fact effective. So let's start with 2013. We start again with the Syrian civil war and the reported use of uh, chemical weapons. Russia came out pretty strongly and asked the international community not to become involved. Um, in September of 2013, I'm going to run through this like a laundry list because it's mostly to give you a bird's eye view of what they were doing that's on an international stage, keeping in mind that at the same time we have things like public diplomacy, student exchanges, the year of culture in UK, all of those things are going on in the background while all of this is going on um, in the international world. So in September 2013, Russia actually comes out and wins maybe some bonus points by suggesting that uh, Syria place all of its chemical weapons under international control. And they take that to the UN. So that might be considered a soft power coup. Then we have Putin's New York Times op-ed on 9-11. Not necessarily great. Um, October 2013, we begin the Olympic torch relay for the Winter Olympics. Vladimir Putin participated in those cer ceremonies. Again, you know, another public diplomacy element. Everybody's excited about, you know, the international goodwill of a sporting event. Um, then in November of 2013, we have the uh, Vilnius Summit, which was supposed to be to hammer out uh, EU cooperation between Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. And the reason why this became contentious as it bled into 2014 was Vladimir Putin in 2011 had a vision for a Eurasian Economic Union, which he announced in 2011 with the goal of establishing it by 2015. Ukraine and Georgia was part of that vision. The Ukrainian president who uh, was subject to some controversy during the Orange Revolution in 2008, backed out of the agreement, reportedly under Russian pressure. Uh, and uh, Viktor, I'm going to butcher his name, I'm sorry, Yanukovych uh, announced resumed trade with Russia. Um, and then in December 2013, uh, as a measure of goodwill, the Russian government released 30 Greenpeace protesters which had been arrested in September for protesting Arctic Circle uh, drilling by the Russian government. They were charged with hooliganism in a seven years prison sentence. So the Russians in ahead of the Winter Games were like, we'll be really nice, we're gonna release these guys. So they released them. They also released the two remaining Pussy Riot members. Um, and at the same time, uh, the president of Ukraine travels to Sochi to hold strategic discussions with Vladimir Putin. Okay. All right, I apologize for the small font, but there was a lot that happened in 2014. All right, so we start off the year of 2014 with the um, US journalist, uh, David Sater is expelled from Satter. Russia, Sater, is uh, expelled from uh, Russia. This is significant because this is the first time a journalist has been expelled from Russia since the Soviet Union. Uh, also another landmark event, uh, Russia's culture minister places a quota on non-Russian made movies similar to Soviet restrictions, again, not seen since the Soviet Union. Um, this is also when the UK and Russia launched their year of culture. Um, in February, we have the beginning of the Winter Olympics at the end of February, around the same time that the Euromaidan protests kick off, and we start to see Russian intervention in those. Those are being contrasted against each other. Uh, we also see the phone call of U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Victoria Nuland, is made public. Um, and there was some question as to whether or not the Russians played a role in making that public. In March, uh, we actually see uh, Russia annexes Crimea, uh, and the RT broadcaster quit on the air due to the broadcasts um, on RT uh, regarding Crimea. Uh, in April, Russia pulls the Voice of America off the air, calling it spam on the airwaves. Uh, and in, really at the end of Mar March and the beginning of April, we see a, a series of close encounters and near misses between Russian military aircraft and naval vessels. They start um, flying uh, almost like bombing practice runs over UK airspace. 
several airspace violations. Uh, they buzz the coastline of California, um, and it's continuing today. Um, fast forward to June. Russia pressures Moldova and Ukraine over the U EU association, and they ban a Marilyn Manson concert. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, let's see. In July, we have the Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 is shot down over eastern Ukraine, and that begins an interesting back and forth on RT and the rest of the world on what actually happened to that airline. Um, Russia also bans fruit and vegetables from Poland over sanctions uh, that they put on them because of the Crimea annexation and threatened to ban other nations' food, which they eventually did do, and then broadcast on RT bulldozers bulldozing over American cheese um, and then labeling food products with like a big bear on it to signify that it was Russian made and so it was okay to buy. Um, in August, Russian forces invade Ukraine. Um, in September, in true uh, active measures fashion, Estoni an Estonian so security service operative is kidnapped by Russian agents, taken to Moscow, and charged with uh, espionage. Uh, in October, Russia cancels student exchanges with the United States, and uh, Vladimir Putin's for the Eurasian Economic Union is formalized in Minsk. And by the end of the year, the ruble collapses in Russia. So it was a busy year for Russia. Okay. So looking at Russia and its interactions with the world from 2013 through 2014 helps to better understand how Russia sees public diplomacy in relation to its other international behavior or how it, maintain, how it achieves foreign policy in the world. So how does it relate to the world? I think throughout this, the, the running theme here is what Russia does in response to perceived threats from the West, whether or not that's true. Uh, Russia perceives the West is actively undercutting their sovereignty um, and undermining the state. And they see that through two areas, primarily through the growth of the EU and the expansion of NATO. Um, it is also felt in terms of the what is perceived as the informational warfare being waged against Russia. And we see this idea in the uh, writings of Igor Nikolaevich Panarin and Alexander Galevich Dugin, who both presuppose an ongoing conflict between the East and the West, as well as the belief that the West has mastered the informational dimension of modern warfare, and hence Western success over the Soviet Union. So that's their evidence. Some of Panarin's and Dugin's ideas are reflected in Russian behavior from late 2013 to 2014. For example, Dugin's Eurasian net-centric model to counter Anglo-American net-centric model. One way to view Russian's behavior from 2013 and early 2014 is through Dugin's recommendations to counter Western net-centric information warfare through the growth of the EU and expansion of NATO, which may have been perceived as endangering Putin's 2011 vision of the Eurasian Economic Union. Another way to look at this is through just Russian diplomacy in general. So Paul Sharp talks about the theory of diplomacy, and he says the diplomatic tradition thus presents people as living in conditions of separateness from one another. Where they may not be physically separated, there is a sense of separateness remains because of their culture, their background, their history. And these conditions give rise to a distinctive form of human relations, relations of separateness. And diplomacy develops to manage these relations. And he act, uh, argues that there is a special strain of diplomacy called revolutionary diplomacy. Now he argues this applies to the United States because we were revolutionaries at one point in our history. Um, but it can also apply to Russia. Uh, in the radical tradition of diplomacy, whereby diplomats and diplomacy are viewed by a group or a nation as the enemy. Diplomat diplomats are seen by revolutionaries to advance the interests of their sovereigns at the expense of others, and even help to initiate violence to serve their interests. They uphold what is viewed by revolutionaries as a repressive system. Russian international relations and foreign policy must be seen in the context of the nation's larger history. A nation which often struggles with its own identity in the world. Is it European or is it Asian? Where does it fit? 
as well as attempting to fit in, such as with Peter the Great and Catherine the Great when they tried to Europeanize Russia. Whether in the optic of Imperial Russia or Soviet Russia or Putin's Russia of today, sorry, where'd it go? <laughs> Uh, I apologize, I hit something. It won't let me advance either. They knew. Okay, I apologize, here we go. There we go. All right, there, sorry. Um, whether Russia's conduct in international relations must be looked at on a continuum between trying to fit in and trying to overthrow the whole system so it works for Russia. In this context, we see Russia's adoption of weather, Western public diplomacy tools, such as the adoption of RT, in response to negative national image, as well as the perception that their power and national security is threatened by the West. But when fitting in doesn't achieve the results for Russia, public diplomacy must be augmented with more traditional Russian tactics. As the events of 2014 and Russia's behavior in 2014 indicates, there's a disconnect between national priorities, perceived threats, and any plan for public diplomacy. While Russia may wish to improve its image and may see that improved image would make achieving foreign policy objectives easier, they perceive this against a real and imminent threat of the West and the ongoing information warfare, which makes the progress of public diplomacy, which tends to be slow, ineffective in the eyes of Russia. RT and Sputnik were intended to change international perceptions of Russia, but more recently have been noted for spreading disinformation and forgeries, which are traditionally techniques used by active measures. Based on this, Russia does not seem to see public diplomacy as another component of active measures, but rather as something distinct, in much the same way that traditional diplomacy may be viewed by Russia as distinct from active measures. Each are used to some degree by Russia to attain foreign policies, but in the context of the perceived threat from the, threat, threat from the West, Russia relies more on active measures to achieve national foreign policy. Additionally, Russia's use of active measures addresses domestic concerns about Soviet unrest and other problems. A good international image is not much help if your domestic public resents the government and unrest develops. It should be noted that Putin's popularity within Russia skyrocketed after the Russian uh, invasion of Crimea. That's all I got. Okay. Would you like to ask any questions? Let me just make one comment. America was not a revolutionary nation. It is a piece of revisionism, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I beg to differ. The king was a revolutionary. Ours was a righteous rebellion against tyranny. So whether we recognize a, or not who we are, Unfortunately, we have a knee-jerk reaction to embrace anything that sounds like a revolution because we're confused. What the heck was that what we did? Well, we tried to maintain continuity in the 18th century against a royal usur uh, usurpation. It's absolutely the opposite of a revolution. Um, American divines studying the revolution in France came to Burkean conclusions without knowing about Edmund Burke. If you study uh, sermons of Protestant divines, they were very suspicious. What the heck it was? It's not like what we had. This righteous rebellion was by men of property. So unfortunately, since the 1960s, the lore of revolution has permeated America's popular culture, and we've become sympathetic to something that in earlier days the American public would recognize as malignant. We are disarmed by uh, 
the rhetorics of, of revolution. And one of the tricks of active measures is to appropriate the language, twist it around, so that we ourselves would be uh, convinced that this is what we want and this is what we would say otherwise. Oh, sorry, just a thought. Otherwise, fantastic questions? Yes, Maria. Sir. Come, come. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, it seems like it's back to the future, you know, with the Russian nationalism, you know, the pre, pre back before the Soviets. I guess, what, what would you say was um, Putin's idea of, an, of the Russian endgame? Uh, that's a really good question. It, I think getting into this presentation, that was sort of where I was trying to go with, because um, I think there was a Daily Beast article that came out about two weeks ago about the, the, the turning point was 2014. And I was trying to understand what happened in 2014 that changed Russia's calculus. Um, and to be honest, in preparing for this, I don't think I actually achieved what the, the zero point was. Um, I think I like to think I got close and I might dig into it some more. Um, I think honestly it was a combination of things. Um, it is the perception of the EU closing in, NATO, the revolutions, and just slipping Russian power. From Vladimir Putin's perspective and their role in the world, I think it's going back to being a world power and being someone that has a role in the world. And the question then becomes, you know, is he trying to, you know, incorporate the Eastern republics that were once under the Soviet Union? Is that his goal? Um, does he think he needs that in order to be considered a world power? Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know without asking him myself. I don't know if he'd give me a straight answer either. Um, you know. I'd, I'd have to dig into it more. Yes, sir. But do we really think this is new? Because Putin's rise to power was calculated under, under Yeltsin. And there was a system of deceptions that were in place in the 90s to, to bring him, to bring this about. Yeah. I'm wondering if this, if this is really, our notion of the Cold War is rather arbitrary, and this is simply a continuation of that conflict. So the, some of the, the informational warfare scholars that a lot of the Russians are really kind of rallying around because that's the big buzzword right now in their in their <coughs> minds is that the world is now about informational warfare and uh, the the West is waging an informational warfare against Russia um, and to that end their idea is is that we bested them with the Soviet Union but the idea is they're gonna try and come back um, and so in that context, in that literature about informational warfare, yeah, they, you know, the Soviet Union's gone, learned from those mistakes, and now we push forward to go back or achieve where we were before kind of thing. Yes? Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the thing that's missing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering where does oil fit in, in your paradise? Mm. And I'm thinking about 2014 with like what, $30 a barrel? Yeah. Uh, and they need about what, 110 to survive? So, cer certainly. Yeah. And I, I th yeah, no, I I completely agree. There's I think there's a lot of things. So in doing this presentation, I don't think you can necessarily pin it to one specific thing. I think it's a combination of things. It was the color revolutions. They freaked them out. The rise of populist movements, um, uh, terrorism, um, all of those things. And I, I 
I think that's very the idea that the price of oil impacted uh, a lot of the the calculus for Russia probably did impact them a lot. And as I said, the the Gazprom thing fell through, um, and that was a contentious issue. Um, and it certainly affected European politics as well in Western Europe uh, with relation to uh, putting sanctions on Russia um, because a lot of them rely on that oil. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's definitely something to explore in the context of why Russia behaves the way it has in that turning point in 2014.